300 years ago, many Puritans believed the return of Christ was imminent. After all, the Great Awakening was divine proof that America was the last stop in the global harvest. Alas, America today is not the America the Puritans knew. America today needs vision. Not political vision or social vision, but a theological vision. And who better to offer that theological vision to America than America's greatest theologian, Jonathan Edwards. Hi, my name is Terence and I'm your host for Reading and Readers, a podcast where I review Christian books for you. Today, I review God's Grand Design, the theological vision of Jonathan Edwards by Sean Michael Lucas. 224 pages published by Crossway in October 2011. This book is a free book of the month of July from Faith Life. You can listen to this review and get the book, or you can just get the book first. After all, why do you need to wait? This podcast This podcast will always be around, but that free offer ends, ends in July. And do you know what other free offer ends? God's offer for our redemption. That also ends. One day, maybe tomorrow, there will be a cosmic conclusion to this age. But Christians do not wait and just sit around doing nothing. For the redemption we receive, we also apply. 300 years ago, Jonathan Edwards saw God's redemption working at those two levels, the cosmic and the personal, the cosmic story of creation and the personal story of a Christian. This vision is found in his letters, sermons, books, and published and unpublished material. But we need someone to bring together the scattered pieces to turn it into a coherent picture, into a proper book because we don't want to go through all those letters, sermons, books, and published and unpublished material ourselves. So who can help us? Who is that person who will bring together all these scattered pieces? I give you Sean Michael Lucas, Professor of Church History at Reformed Theological Seminary. His first published work back in 2003 was The Legacy of Jonathan Edwards, American Religion and the Evangelical Tradition. Uh, Sean Michael Lucas was the one of the editors and he was also a contributing essayist. Writing on Jonathan Edwards is no easy task, as Lucas explains. I quote, One of the things that makes the study of Jonathan Edwards overwhelming is the sheer amount of literature. First, of course, is the amount of literature written by, jo- by Edwards himself, while the definitive Yale University Press print edition filled 26 volumes. The Jonathan Edwards Center at Yale University has made available transcriptions of a wide range of materials online that total 73 volumes. Obviously, any attempt to master Edwards is futile, although we now have a better opportunity and access than ever before to know what he said. End quote. So while Lucas says that any attempt to master Edwards is futile, the books he has read on Edwards, the books he has written on Edwards, including this book that we are reviewing now, shows a dedicated attempt to capture Jonathan Edwards' theological vision. Thus, the situation before you is this. Professor Sean Michael Lucas has done a heroic attempt to distill Edwards' vision into 200 or so pages. The question before you is, will you make an attempt at Jonathan Edwards? And this is no trivial question. For Edwards comes from a time when a book title is a long sentence, a sentence is a long paragraph, and a paragraph is a long essay or an entire book. By our standards, the Puritan writings are slow, long, convoluted, yet promising to be deep, meditative, and soul-enriching. But you say, this book, God's Grand Design, was not written by Jonathan Edwards. It's written by Sean Michael Lucas. So it's easy, right? It's easy to read. And that's why you need to listen to this review. 
God's grand design by Sean Michael Lucas is divided into two parts. Part one is redemption history, and part two is redemption applied. So you hear here the cosmic and the personal. In part one, we have four chapters, namely chapter one, God's grand design, the glory of God. Chapter two, God's end in creating the world, creation, nature, fall. Three, the great errand of Christ, which is redemption. And four, the summum and ultimum, consummation. From, from these uh, four chapter headings, you can, see, you can see God's grand design. But if you were expecting a brisk walk from Genesis to Revelation, you won't get it. The book here assumes you already have an outline of redemptive history. And if you don't, there are better books to trace the outline for redemptive history. What Lucas offers here instead is Jonathan Edwards' thoughts, his commentary on redemptive history. And that's what you will get in part one. In part two, Redemption Applied, we have seven chapters, starting with chapter five, a Divine and Supernatural Light. Six, The Nature of True Religion. Holy Affections. 7. The Dark Side of Religious Affections. Self-Deception. 8. A Love Life. How the Affections Produce Genuine Virtue. 9. Means of Grace. The, mystery, the Ministry of the Word. 10. Means of Grace. The Sacraments of Baptism and the Lord's Supper. 11. Means of Grace. Prayer, Personal and Global. And the last chapter is 12. The Christian Life as a Journey to Heaven. The way the book is written, you never doubt that what Lucas writes is what Edwards thought. You know how helpful it is when someone makes a biblical argument that they quote the Bible verse? Lucas here does the same. When he tells us that this is Edwards' theological opinion, he quotes an Edwards' sermon or book or letter. And along the way, Lucas also gets us familiar with other writers on Edwards. And there are many. <laughs> there are many writers on Jonathan Edwards. And uh, we can see how many there are uh, in Appendix 1. Appendix 1 is an annotated bibliography. And it's so useful, it's so useful that you should just download this book, which, can I just remind you, is free for July from Faith Life. So just download this free book for this appendix. Because you might never read Lucas's book, okay? You, you might never touch this book. But you might read or be interested to read a book that he recommends here. For example, he briefly reviews in this appendix, uh, he reviews four biographies on Edwards. You have a big one, a short one, a Harvard one, and an Ian Murray one. The one by Ian Murray is particularly uh, interesting to me. And there are around 20 books in this uh, survey uh, appendix of his. And I, as I read through it, I appreciate his candor as he reviews on uh, Edward's book. Okay? This is one of uh, Jonathan Edward's famous books, The Life of Brainerd. Lucas writes, I quote, I am not a big fan of that book. While Edward's attempted to produce a case study in piety, Brainerd strikes me as overly morose and inward, end quote. Now, considering that the life of Brainerd is the book that launched a million missions, <laughs> I like how Lucas is able to critique his hero. To him, Edwards is a man like us. That's actually the title of his essay, which we can find in Appendix 2. In this essay, A Man Like Us, Jonathan Edwards and Spiritual Formation for Ministerial Candidates, this one looks like, uh, reads like a biographical, biographical sketch, but uh, Lucas says it's not. Um, it was written to trace through this spiritual formation and it's meant to be an encouragement to us, the reader. So why was it that uh, I finished the book feeling quite discouraged? And unless uh, you can get a hint of this, actually, by listening to what Lucas wrote in the introduction. After briefly describing the themes that he will cover in this book, he, I quote, To chart these themes well means that at times this book may be rough sledding for some. 
Having taught on Jonathan Edwards to seminarians, I've walked with them through his naughty passages and complex thoughts. But these require careful thought, precise statement, and sometimes rereading. And that's the reason I was discouraged, because there were sections in this book where I didn't understand. I know Edwards is saying something profound, and Lucas is translating it to my everyday language, but I still couldn't understand it, even after rereading it a few times. Which is why my early drafts for this book review was quite unfavorable. I felt like I didn't gain much. I felt like I completed the book but came out empty, and I hated that. And um, that, at least that's how I felt until I referred to my notes. I used Logos software to read uh, these uh, free books. And uh, so, as I refer to it, that's to prepare this for this review, um, there's a list of what I highlighted as I went through the book. And as I went through the list, the highlight list, I was surprised by how much I actually gained. Edwards is really dense. There's, there's so much stuff packed into his uh, words, into his ideas. And uh, the little that I gleaned, was also dense, so I did manage to get something, so I was uh, quite happy in, in the end. I include this uh, personal reflection early in this review, just to be upfront about the difficulty of grasping Edward's theological vision, because as Lucas reminds us, it requires careful thought, precise statement, and sometimes rereading. But I just want to assure you that there is spiritual gold here, and I just want to share with you two nuggets of gold, and one from each part of the book, part one and part two. The big idea in part one is God's glory. And God's glory is the fount from which John Piper sweeps his hands wide. Can you imagine that? No, he's sweeping his hands wide and he's gasping at God's self-glorifying majesty and he's inviting all of God's creatures to be in Christ-centered awe. All right, so that's Piper. And that is the big idea in part one. But I won't be talking about that, <laughs> even though that's the main, main part of part one. Instead, I want to talk about a small thing. I want to talk about one of Jonathan Edwards' notebook that might inspire me to start my own. Uh, Lucas writes, I quote, Because the end of creation is to reflect God's glory back to him, it is not surprising that Edwards sought to read creation itself for signs of God's excellency, beauty, and glory. In order to assist him in these reflections, Edwards put together a notebook that he entitled Images of Divine Things. In the notebook, he draws parallels between things he saw in God's world and truths found in Scripture. End quote. So what I read next okay, is an extensive quote of Lucas citing multiple examples from this notebook of his, from Edwards' notebook. I quote, Roses and thorns signify that all temporal sweets are mixed with bitter, but even more that the crown of glory can come only by bearing Christ's cross by a life of mortification, self-denial, and labor, and bearing all things for Christ. So that's what um, Edwards reflected when he saw, when he pondered upon the roses and the thorns. Okay? Let me continue uh, to quote. The way snakes are able to charm birds in order to kill them are lively representations of the devil's catching our souls by his temptations. The silkworm stands as a type of Christ in this way. When it dies, it yields us that of which we make such glorious clothing. Christ became a worm for our sakes and by his death finished that righteousness with which believers are clothed. The waves of the ocean during a storm have a representation of the terrible wrath of God and amazing misery of them that endure it. Lightning commonly strikes high mountains, spires, trees and the like. This signifies that heaven is an enemy to all proud persons and that especially makes such the marks of his vengeance. End quote. Okay, end quote. 
And as uh, I read this part, I was very much reminded by Charles Spurgeon. It's the sort of thing that Charles Spurgeon did quite uh, often. And uh, it's also the sort of thing that I have learned to avoid in preaching or teaching because these type of illustrations too easily become what people focus on and remember. These illustrations are man-made. You can make anything say anything you want. There is no control. In contrast, if you stick close to the text, you are on sure ground because you are safely constrained by the text, not just by aimlessly looking at nature and clouds and sky and stars and then just making a, a scriptural application just by thinking about them. Okay, That is what I thought, that's what I believe and still somewhat believe. Okay, It's still something that I believe, that um, there is no control. But you see, after reading Edwards, and I just love how he loves God so much that he sees God's truth everywhere. In the flowers, in the animals, in weather, and everyday things, okay? Even roles like marriage, uh, he would just reflect and just see God's truth reflecting out of all these uh, objects. And I see it as an evidence, as an evidence of a man constantly thinking, meditating, and just looking for God in everywhere. And... Uh, I would like to be such a man, though I don't think I'll preach and teach or at least be very careful about that. But it is such a wonderful thing to just be looking around you and just jotting down your thoughts and see, oh, how wonderful God's creation today is. It reminded me, it reminded me, it's not proof of it, but it reminded me of God's truth in Scripture in this respect. So I thought that was quite nice. And uh, let's go to the second uh, nugget of gold. <laughs> if part one of this book is familiar to me, it's because of John Piper, who is the one who introduced Jonathan Edwards to me. Reading part one, you cannot fail to see Edwards' influence on Piper's ministry. There is a lot of Edwards in Piper. Now, if we go to part two, uh, chapters five to eight is familiar to me because I read Jonathan Edwards' Uh, religious Affections. Okay, it's a short book, uh, Religious Affections. I have recommended this book to young people who see a lack of emotions in some services. People are just having no emotions. And you go to other services and there is a flood of emotions. People are greatly demonstrating. They are crying. They are shouting. They are so happy. They are so sad. And then the young people come and ask me, oh, what am I supposed to make of it? I mean, are we supposed, what, what, what are we supposed to feel in a service? And so, um, to some, I actually recommended Religious Affections by Jonathan Edwards because I think um, that his thorough, meditative, and precise study on this very issue has settled the matter once and for all. Okay, he wrote it so well, I thought that there was nothing else that needed to be said. It was just conclusive. There was really nothing else that uh, anyone could improve on Jonathan Edwards' uh, religious affections. At least that's what I thought until I read Lucas's book. Now, in these four chapters, uh, as, I, um, as I read through, he picks up on things that I didn't notice before. And... and honestly, uh, maybe would have never noticed if not for uh, Lucas's book. For example, in chapter 7, The Dark Side of Religious Affections, Lucas begins the chapter by writing, I quote, Though many people are familiar with at least some of Edward's argument in religious affections, they are probably unaware that there is another, darker side to what he was saying, end quote. Uh, Lucas later explains what this uh, darker side is, I quote, and as already noted, the burden of religious affections was to mark out what true revival and conversion look like. However, what must be recognized is that Edwards also sought to identify the characteristics of false religion, or to put it differently, he attempted to show colonial men and women that they very well might have been self-deceived about their spiritual condition. End quote. 
And the signs that these uh, people were claiming that were evidence of their spiritual wellness, their spiritual uh, strength and so on, are uh, inconclusive. Okay? That is what is uh, how Lucas uh, goes through each evidence here, one at a time, and just explaining it. For example, having extraordinary affections where you have emotions raised to a high pitch does not mean you are converted. Being able to speak fluently and at length of your spiritual experience doesn't mean you are converted. Being able to quote scripture or have Bible verses come magically or directly to the mind doesn't, does not mean you are converted. I quote Lucas. Uh, the devil himself can bring texts of scripture to the mind and misapply them in such a way to draw people away from God rather than to him. End quote. And similarly, a strong response to the word may not mean anything. A free and engaged worship may also not mean anything. Lucas writes, I quote, All of these signs are really not signs of a changed life. They are inconclusive tests whether someone has truly experienced a new sense of the heart, new and holy affections that produce spiritual understanding and holy practice. Those who rest on these signs have the potential of being self-deceived about their condition. And that is because these signs can be counterfeited, produce hypocrisy, or subject the individual to enthusiasm in ways that cause him or her to be lost in the end. End quote. Now let us take a step back for a while to see why this book is helpful. Religious Affections was written in 1746. Jonathan Edwards wrote this in response to what was happening in the Great Awakening. And if you think that the Great Awakening is what happens after you just had a great afternoon napping, then you are evidence number one on why everyone needs to read more Christian books, especially church history. Coming back, in the Great Awakening, there was a flood of spiritual experiencing, uh, experiences coming through the various churches. And people thought because they had a spiritual experience, that that means that they are spiritually touched, okay, indwelt by the Holy Spirit and thus converted and thus saved. And Jonathan Edwards, the pastor, says no. Lucas uh, further explains uh, later on, I quote, following the 17th century American Puritan Thomas Shepard, Edwards distinguished between legal hypocrites and evangelical hypocrites. Legal hypocrites are those who are deceived by their outward morality and external religion. Evangelical hypocrites are those that are deceived with false discoveries and elevations, which often cry down works and men's own righteousness and talk much of free grace. Of the two, Edwards clearly saw that the latter as more dangerous. Evangelical hypocrites are self-deceived, having based their confidence of eternal salvation on false signs, and yet defending themselves by claiming that they have the witness of the Spirit. End quote. Guys, don't you think that what I just read could so easily apply to what we sometimes witness in today's church? This is not a Pentecostal or charismatic rant, that is not what I'm saying. But I think that wherever you are, okay, whether it's Pentecostal, charismatic or not, there is a sense that uh, evangelical hypocrites are around. They think that they are saved. They use various evidences, which are really not evidences. They are inconclusive. They are false signs. And therefore, they are lost. So what we have here is that if we understand the meaning of all the argument of what uh, Jonathan Edwards is saying over here about false affections and evangelical hypocrites, uh, these ways, these words actually, they offer a way for anyone to soberly reflect on their spiritual condition. And I think that this is uh, quite important and I think that it's something for us to be aware of. I mean, we don't want to be plastic flowers not knowing that we are plastic we think we have life, but actually we do not. So those are the two uh, nuggets of gold that I picked out, that I mined out very ex with a lot of uh, exhaustively, uh, in the sense that very in very tired manner 
with a lot of effort, I mine these two gold nuggets for you. In my book reviews, I want to make sure that you learn something, even if you eventually don't read the book. So I hope that you will see, number one, uh, God's truth everywhere you go, in the lightning, in the clouds, wherever you go, and just think about God in, in, and God's truth as reflected through His creation. Number two, I hope that you find these uh, phrases helpful. False affections, I think uh, you can go look at the definition, uh, John Edwards' definition, I think is very strong, very good. And uh, evangelical hypocrites, and uh, gives you a category, a way to think about um, what we see sometimes in our churches, or even in ourselves. So it's good for reflection, personal reflection over here. As I go into my concluding thoughts, I am still selective of who I think would be a good fit for this book. You will note that throughout this book review, I refer to Edwards and Lucas sometimes interchangeably. And that's a credit to Lucas because he parks the reader in the mind of Jonathan Edwards throughout the book. And that is also a problem because Lucas aims to keep the precise statements here precise. He is reluctant to dumb down Edwards for dumb dumbs like me. I don't mean you, I mean me. <laughs> so, <laughs> like I said earlier, I would read, then reread, and then reread. And actually, at one point in, the, in reading this book, I, I thought that maybe there is something wrong with my comprehension. <laughs> the, the words are in English, I don't understand what they mean. I got so frustrated, I actually skipped to the appendix just to check whether I could understand Lucas' essays when he is away from Edward's original source material. <laughs> and to my relief, I found that I can understand Lucas when he is using uh, his own voice, his own writer's voice. The problem occurs for me when he is using Edward's speak. The complex thought, the naughty uh, structure, it was... Uh, it can sometimes be difficult. But as you heard me um, quote some of the, of the work from the, today's book, I hope you, you can uh, consider giving it a try. That is, if you are interested. Because you see, if you don't know Jonathan Edwards or are uninterested in church history, especially American church history, or in theology, or in Puritan literature, then I really don't think this is the book for you. Because this book needs something in you for the book to work with. And a better entry into the world of Jonathan Edwards would be, could be one of the other books that Lucas re recommends in Appendix 1. So even though you don't read the book, as I said, you must well download the book because then you might want to read the Appendix 1, just Appendix 1 by itself, and just browse through what his, this expert's thought on the other books uh, around are. Or you could just read Religious Affections by Jonathan Edwards. Uh, it's a good book. I still think it's a very readable book. And it settles an argument that is still relevant today, the role of emotions in services. Even though reading this book was rough sledding, I am happy that I finished the book. I can tick off one Puritan book for the year. Yes, I know God's Grand Design was published 11, not 300 years ago. And yes, I know the author is still alive, unlike the Puritans he writes about. But 300-year-old wine is still 300-year-old wine. Whether it's served in the original bottle, in the original covers of the book, or in a modern wine glass, served in small portions. Um, Lucas preserves much of Edward's style and thoughts for all the good and bad that brings. Let me close this review with this quote. Lucas here is explaining the purpose behind one of uh, Edwards' uh, writing. So I quote, Edwards' larger purpose was to raise his congregation's vision from its apparently mundane and petty daily concerns to find their affections engaged by the cosmic purpose that God has in his work of redemption. End quote. If you want a vision of God's redemption in the cosmic sense and in the personal, through the eyes of America's Puritan theologian par excellence, get this book. This 
is a reading and reader's review of God's Grand Design, The Theological Vision of Jonathan Edwards by Sean Michael Lucas. 224 pages published by Crossway in October 2011 and it's available for free from Faith Life only in July and $12.99 in Amazon Kindle as of this recording. Before you go, before you go, normally I don't do this, but I am excited to tell you about the next book I aim to review. It's Biblical Worship Theology for God's Glory. The editors are Benjamin K. Forrest, Walter C. Kaiser Jr. and Vernon M. Wiley. 544 pages published by Craigle Academic in February 2021. It's a very recent book. It's a very thick book, a very recent book, and written, edited by really top scholars. Uh, it's available for $29 in Amazon Kindle. Uh, the, the list price is uh, $42.99. Okay, so it's $29 in Amazon, but it's listed as $40, $43. But the reason I'm telling you about this book now is because it's only $9.99 in Logos. Okay, you go to www.logos.com and then you go to the free book of the month and you scroll all the way downwards and you see that there's other deals and this book is offered at around 70%, 80% discount and it's only offered for this month, July. Now, the thing why I'm telling you about this is because it's 500 pages. I don't know whether I'll be in time to review biblical worship before the offer ends. I don't know whether I can complete the review before the end of July. I'll be cutting it very, very close, I, I think. So I am eight chapters in, and unless the remaining 26 chapters is a dud, I found that this is an immensely helpful resource for worship. You have one guy who writes a chapter on worship in the book of Leviticus, another guy writes a chapter on worship in the book of Joshua, another guy writes an entire chapter on worship in the book of Judges. And that's how it kind of looks like for the all the chapters in the book. And if you don't know why that is a big deal, why that is important or so cool, uh, just uh, stay tuned for my next review. The thing is that if you already know that this book is for you, then get it. It's in Logos for July uh, for $9.99 from a list price of $42.99. Okay, so $10 versus $43. I just can't see it ever getting discounted further than that. It's 544 pages. I mean, how cheap do you need to be? And then uh, for you need to go. And it's uh, it was published in 2021. And you have, I don't recognize the other two editors, but you have Walter C. Kaiser Jr. So um, it's it's a good book. I, I think it's a steal, actually. So if you if you like that tip, this uh, book buying tip, uh, you can always, and you would like to show some appreciation, uh, you, <laughs> you can buy me coffee. You can just go to www.readingandreaders.com. You will see lots of my other book reviews, uh, all written transcripts and, and so on. And at the same time, you can go and click on the buy me a coffee button just to show a bit of appreciation uh, for giving you a good deal. So I hope, uh, hope that uh, you'll be uh, uh, listening to that review and you can let me know what you think about today's review or any other review. That's all from me. Thank you for listening.